Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. We're going to move on to the next one. We have three speakers um, that are going to all three stay within 30 minutes. <laughs> I'm trusting them on that. And so, uh, um, but they have a lot to talk about. They've got a lot of great experience. So the title of that presentation is 25 Years Later, How Risk to Tomato Spotted Wilt Virus Was Addressed in the Southeastern U.S. Um, Steve Brown, um, is one of the speakers, the executive director of the Peanut Foundation. He was also an assistant dean, um, and at one point he was a practicing entomologist. Uh, there's also Albert Culbreth, who's a professor at the University of Georgia who works on fungal diseases and tomato spotted wilt and, and other things as well. And also Bob Kimmerate, he's a professor at UGA, an extension specialist who works in peanuts and numerous other crops. And Steve is going to start us off, and the other folks are going to come up. Um, and use the same slide set. So thanks for coming. Thanks, David. It's an opportunity here, a great opportunity for us to talk about 25 years of the former tomato spotted wilt risk index and now the peanut RX. Uh, as David said, we're gonna try to tag team this. Uh, Albert and Bob are still contributing to this day to the peanut RX. And as the old retired guy, I'm gonna to try to start off with a historical perspective here. Um, spotted wilt literally threatened the survival of the peanut industry in the Southeast during the 1990s. It came on very quickly. Land grant universities found themselves with no answers like this county agent scratching his head in the field. Every field had some damage, but the severity varied greatly. And for no apparent reason, some fields made a decent yields while others were a total loss. In fact, right next to this field was a field that didn't look near as bad as this one. You can follow the progression of tomato spotted wilt in this slide. Um, basically, it moved from west to east over a couple of decades. It's vectored by a couple of species of thrips, and I don't think it's any coincidence that uh, the movement of tomato spotted wilt west to east kind of followed the movement of western flower thrips from the west to the east. So you can see kind of some of the highlighted dates over that time. It is absolutely a, a coincidence, pure coincidence, that Albert Colbert moved to Georgia in 1989 and that I moved to Georgia in 1990, and that all hell broke loose right after that. As you can imagine, the industry was quite concerned about the situation. Um, the uh, progression of the disease over that period of 1990, when we first started seeing it to 1997, uh, was just straight up. Uh, it got worse every year, and we were approaching $45 million worth of losses just in Georgia. This picture is taken uh, from a Georgia peanut tour sometime during the late 1990s. I don't remember exactly what year this was, but this is from out of Paugus, Georgia, where much of the early research was conducted. Jim Todd, the research entomologist at the time, Albert, the research pathologist, myself as the extension entomologist, and Simi McCowan, who was Jim's very talented technician. The four of us did much of the early work during those, those uh, 1990 years. You'll notice all the colored flags in these research plots, all those little flags across the field were placed by the four of us individually. Each flag represented an infected plant and each color represented a, a time during the season when that plant first started showing symptoms. We flagged all of those plots, sometimes crawling on our hands and knees down the rows, uh, placing those flags. So there was a lot of early work that went into this. The early research showed that there were several factors that were contributing to the incidence of the severity of tomato spotted wilt. And it became obvious that 
some factors were more important than others, but none of them were quite strong enough to really warrant a recommendation that, hey, do this and you'll have less tomato spotted wilt. Um, but it did start to become clear that they were additive, that we could start putting some of these things together. And if we put two or three of them together, we could start making a significant difference in spotted wilt. Notice the question mark too. There was always, we thought, some other factors that we didn't even know about that were maybe affecting the severity. And maybe to this day, there are factors that we don't know about. In 1995, Albert, Jim, Todd, and I attended an international possible virus conference in Taiwan. After that conference, we traveled to Australia to observe peanut production there. Tomato spotted wilt was first described in Australia in 1917, I believe it was, in tomatoes. Um, so we wanted to go to Australia. We looked at peanut production there. They weren't reporting any losses to tomato, to tomato spotted wilt at the time. And indeed, we didn't find any uh, on our trips uh, during that year. We, we found no spotted wilt. So our minds were spinning at the time. We'd gone to this conference. We were thinking about what in the world are we going to do to try to stop this problem from getting any worse? Lying in bed one night at the Burks and Wills Hotel, Motel in Kingroy, Queensland, Australia, it occurred to me, why don't we describe this to growers as in terms of risk, a concept that growers are very familiar with, so that we could give numerical values to some of these different factors and try to weight how important they were and present a risk management concept to the growers. Over breakfast the next morning, the three of us talked about it, and we first started building a risk index from the information that we knew 25 years ago. This picture was taken on a subsequent visit to Australia just a few years ago. I was much younger the original time, and um, as the sign says, you may not can see it up there, it says free Wi-Fi now, but there's, there was no Wi-Fi. 25 years ago, I assure you. Um, this is one of the early versions of the risk index. Each uh, box there shows one of the different factors and the numerical values that we assign to those factors. Um, and then the, the grower was asked to add those up. And at the bottom, the index showed whether you were low, moderate, or high risk. Admittedly, the first versions of the index were our best guesses. We, we assigned values based on small plot data and we tried our best to give it the right value, but it was admittedly guesses. Over time, it became better. We knew from the beginning that we would throw out some numbers, but we were gonna have to validate it. We were gonna have to go out in the real world and see, is this working? So these are some of the early validation studies. We went to numerous fields, literally thousands of fields over several years. These were commercial grower fields. We gathered background information. We plotted risk index value on the x-axis and spotted wilt severity on the uh, y-axis. And admittedly, some of these first years, the, the regression lines were, were pretty weak. I mean, there was, there was a trend there, but uh, pretty pretty wild variation, but over time it started getting better. And one thing you'll notice over time, by the time we get to the lower right over here, we were finding fewer and fewer fields that were high risk. The growers were listening to us. They were starting to change their practices and we didn't have as many fields that were considered high risk uh, several years into this project. So we started to validate and not only did we validate draw a regression line, but we would try to figure out the outliers. Uh, if we had outliers, we'd say, why are they outliers? And you'll notice the circle at the top, we circled those. Those were all April planted Georgia greens. So we thought, are we giving enough points to the April planting date? So this was all part of the process over the years, and we kept changing those values and modifying them as we learned more. Um, one thing that just really contributed to the success of the index was collaboration. We, we immediately started talking to our counterparts in other states 
And we started having an annual meeting where we would invite people, multidisciplinary, research extension, everybody that had an interest in it. And we would, we would meet at a state park, which was right there close to where Alabama, Georgia, and Florida all come together. And we'd rent some cabins. This was in December. We had shared data, we had talked about it, we had decide on how to modify the risk index for the next year. And then we'd have time to get that incorporated into our publications and our presentations for the grower meetings for the next year. So in that picture, it's kind of dark, you may not can see it, but you may recognize some people you know. Uh, that's Dan Gorbett in the back, Jim Todd, uh, John Beasley's there, Ron Weeks is there, this is Albert down in the bottom right. So there were many, many other people who don't happen to be in this picture, but there was, uh, the, the point is there was a lot of collaboration. The message to the growers was, you don't have to adopt every component of the index. Some people would say, yeah, I, I like Timic, I don't really want to use Thymet. So our message was, you don't have to. The goal is to get your total risk down to 65 points or less. Anyway, you can do that we feel like you're gonna have less tomato spotted wilt. In summary, an effective risk index is a scientific model. It's, it's modeling a scientific or a, a biological system. And by nature, it's very complex. Risk index is a communication tool also. It was a way that we communicated to the growers, hey, this is complex. There's a lot of things going into this and these are some of the things you can do. Um, it was not a traditional university recommendation, but a framework within which growers can devise their own recommendations. Um, biological systems evolve, therefore risk indexes have to evolve. We had to change every year. And a risk index must be constantly validated to ensure accuracy. So we did a lot of validation. So I, I want to leave you with some of, the, some of you in the room, some of you younger folks, some of you graduate students that may face problems like this in the future. You may face something that we don't even know about right now. Um, maybe a risk index won't be the answer to that problem, but some of the things we learned during this process, I think are worth noting. The value of learning from previous science. We learned from the Texas people. Texas experienced spotted wilt before we did. They were the first to notice that there was a planting date effect. Our planting date effect was a little different than what they were seeing, but we had the same effect that they saw. We learned from Texas. Um, the value of international travel, the very fact that this idea was born on an international trip. We were experiencing things outside of our environment. We were learning from other people all over the world, learning why it's not bad here, but it is bad here. That experience of international travel is always valuable. The value of seeing more than one contributing factor at a time. I think we tend to have a tendency to look at our own world research and we look at that one factor and we study it to death, but you gotta back up and look at the big picture sometime and look at all the factors that are contributing. The value of validation, if it's, you know, it can make all kinds of sense on paper, but if it's not working out there in the field, then it doesn't have a whole lot of value. So you've got to validate, you've got to go out and make sure it's doing what you think it's doing. And then again, the value of communication, the value that, you know, you, you've got to not only do it, but you've got to communicate to everybody what you're doing and why you're doing it. So with that, I'm going to let Albert take the next leg of this. And, um, We'll take questions later. Thank you, Steve. It's an honor to be here. It's been an honor to be involved in the, the, the spotted wilt process. I'm primarily a researcher, Bob, and, and uh, Steve, are primarily extension folks, so it's the, my perspective on the, the handling of the, the risk. The thing I wanted to start on, though, was the state of risk we were in when I first got to Georgia. Uh, and our recipe for a severe epidemic, uh, that's something we teach in our introductory plant pathology uh, classes, 
But at that time, we had a near monoculture of about 750,000 acres of TSWB susceptible varieties grown in the southeast and was grown in Georgia at that point in time. Most of that was flow runner. We had the introduction of TSWB, uh, again, a, an extremely susceptible uh, variety. Uh, we were still planting very early. We were moving to, to uh, sparser seeding rates. So we had a, an excellent recipe for the epidemic when the, the virus was moved in. Um, Western flower thrips came, but we already had tobacco thrips, both of which were very competent vectors. And uh, as Steve pointed out, things really broke loose uh, those last, those, those next few years. With such a susceptible um, variety as Forerunner, of course, one of the, the key things we were, were looking for was resistance, anything that could help us reduce the risk through um, a, a different variety. Southern Runner had already been released, it was, it was never really accepted as a, as a cultivar, but it, we found it did have a moderate level of resistance to uh, tomato spotted wilt virus. Again, never really caught on on, on, on a, a large scale basis, but it was there. Uh, it was it provided a much needed suppression of spotted wilt compared to the to flow runner. Uh, but in spite of it not ever being accepted really as a as a, a widespread use commercial cultivar, it was a key factor in the addressing spotted wilt. It was apparent uh, in a, a lot of crosses, one of which gave us Georgia Green, which was a key factor in, in our addressing spotted wilt and, and turning the curve on the, the losses that we, we saw starting after that extreme loss in 1997. Georgia Green was released in 1996. A TSWV resistant cultivar, a moderate level of resistance. It needed all the help it could get. It became very quickly the predominant cultivar grown in the Southeast. I think it was a huge factor in uh, literally saving the, the industry, uh, but we needed more resistance too. Uh, the thing about Georgia Green, uh, so many of the factors that Steve talked about in the in the index, Georgia Green responded to uh, changes in planting date, increased seed population, the at plant insecticide thymet. Um, we had a lot of insecticides that we can control trips with, but that's the only one we've, we've had that helps actually um, suppress spotted wilt. Uh, twin row patterns, uh, strip tillage. Uh, so all that package really helped us put an, uh, a dent in, in the spotted wilt losses that we were, we were fighting there. The next reduced risk um, variety that, that came on board was C9 and 9R. Um, I think I skipped that, yeah. And C9 and 9R was, was released in 1996, primarily for lately late leaf spot resistance, but it did have an improved le level of spotted wilt resistance um, compared to Georgia Green. Uh, it was adopted um, on a more acreage typically than Southern Runner, but never really became widespread, but it reduced the risk from, 50, from 20 points that we were looking at with Georgia Green uh, down to 15. So it was a, it was a, a small step in, in a lot of ways, but a, a huge one in others. Again, never really accepted on a, a extremely wide scale basis, but it was a, a key factor in breeding programs, um, not just in Georgia and or not just in Florida where it came from, but in uh, um, Georgia as well. It became the parent of Georgia 06G, Georgia Greener, Georgia 07W, Florida 07, and TIF Guard. And that, that group of varieties had a huge impact on, on peanut production in the, in the southeastern United States. Um, all of those became, um, were, were 10 point varieties. So reduced the risk five points compared to the best that we had previously, the C9 and NR. And, uh, um, of course, O6G is still the predominant variety grown in, in the southeast, uh, but the combination of those, the level of resistance that has, they had to tomato spotted wilt virus, as well as some other pathogens, that group has had a tremendous impact on, on peanut production, 
helping us uh, literally survive and you know, into the, the uh, current situation. Again, Georgia 06 G still um, our predominant variety uh, and a much reduced risk compared to the floor runner that we were looking at um, in the, the late 19. 80s and early 1990s. Breeding continues and has continued to look for better and better resistance. Um, this slide shows some, a um, couple of the, the better lines. Georganic uh, was, re was released. Uh, the 94022 is not acceptable as a, as a variety, but has been, been used and is being used in, in genetic studies and, and uh, crossing patterns. So hope for the future. Jorganic was released as a flea spot TSWV resistant variety. It was our, our first five point category uh, variety. It was used some in organic production on a limited scale. Had a red test of those. So it was never really used as a, a widespread commercial cultivar. But the impact of, of that variety is, is still being seen. As with others in the past that were not not used as widely, it was a, an important and is an important um, parent being used. It's a parent of Georgia 12Y, which currently um, is the best resistant variety we have in terms of uh, reduced risk to tomato spot and wilt virus. Uh, it's a five point category. This picture shows a, just a comparison of Georgia 12Y to Sun Oleg 97R, which is about the same resistance level as, as Forerunner had. So a night and day difference that from where we started back in the, the late 1980s to where we um, are now. Again, this shows the same variety, same susceptible variety, some like 97R compared to a, one of the most resistant breeding lines that I've ever worked with. Again, uh, 94022 is not acceptable for commercial production, but it has a tremendous um, resistance, field resistance to tomato spotted wilt virus. So the hope for the future. So we 12 y you know, a couple of other five point varieties we have now, um, but I think the, the future for um, reducing further our risk to tomato spotted wilt virus lies in our, our germplasm. David Bertiotti will talk to us in just a few minutes about beyond the genome and, and such. I think that's the secret for um, conquering tomato spotted wilt virus in, in peanut. One you know, hope, hope for the future. The other thing I wanted to mention is 4-8 insecticide. And Scott Monfort will talk about the sustainability, availability of, of pesticides for peanuts and the importance of that. That's been, the 4 has been really the only insecticide that's helped us reduce to, to the risk of tomato spotted wilt virus. This shows a picture of the burn that spotted wilt uh, causes. So it's ugly. Um, I wouldn't want to use it if I didn't have to, but it's something we, we found out early, even things like um, Floor Runner, Georgia Green responded to it, but the varieties we have now still respond to that. Uh, and the impact of, of the use of thymet can take us from a 15 point risk to a five point just for the insecticide. This is a shot beside, beside um, the plots were not side by side, but were from the same rep uh, of the response of Georgia Green to thymet. We still see a, a very significant response to this insecticide. A major part of our, our risk management program in peanut, it, it does control thrips, but it does a lot more uh, than that. Over the years, uh, where the black line here would show what we would expect if it's a one-to-one -one relationship between uh, thymet non-treated versus thymet treated, this is across uh, pretty much all the varieties that we have available now over the last several years. We get about a 30 to 35% reduction in, in incidence and severity of spotted wilt with the use of thymet. So again, that, that combination of using the best field resistance we have with as many different factors as we have. Uh, and, and again, the thymet is one of the, the factors we can put together in most any field where we're growing peanuts in the Southeast. That I think is a key factor for us in managing spotted wilt now 
And of course, I think genetics and improved resistance is going to be key for us for the future. So with that, I'll move on and turn things over to uh, uh, Bob. David Langston just looked at his watch and he looked at the schedule and he watched me walk up on here and said, ain't no way. <laughs> you may have done that too, David Jordan. I want to appreciate it. I want to thank you all for being here today. What my job is for the last 10 minutes is just to spot it. I can do it. I've run a two-minute drill. I can tell you that the, the most important thing I want to convey to you today is that we've heard the history. We've heard the history, but the most important thing now is that PNRX and the, what the, the genesis of the tomato spotted wolf risk index is a living document. It's a living, it continues to build. And that's what I want to convey to you is that it's not just what we've done, but it's where we're going now. And if you look at this slide, what you'll see on there is you'll see not only tomato spotted wolf virus, but you also see stem rot or white mold. You also see leaf spot. Because what's happened since the first tomato spotted wolf risk index came out is something that's continued along the way. And we've seen that we can build that same concept that Steve talked about dreaming about one night in the Kingaroy, uh, Australia. That same concept can be used for other diseases as well. We've seen the risk index. We've seen the drop, the rise and fall of the tomato spotted wilt virus. But as of 2008, I believe in 2008, the peanut or X first came out. The peanut or X really was a combination of the spotted wilt risk index, but recognizing that that same concept for predicting risk, a lot of the same factors with inclusion of some additional factors could be used for stem rot or white mold and leaf spot as well. So peanut or X is really the genesis of that idea that Steve had and it was built upon by all those researchers back in 1995 and beyond by increasing and looking at inclusion of other diseases as well. So from where we were, from where we were back when Steve and Albert and whoever else was in Australia to where we are today in Dallas, Texas, What's happened? Expanded participation, research to improve prediction. Spotted wood index has been used as a model by other people, expanding the risk index. Industry cooperation and sharing the index with growers and beyond. Expanded participation. It started out at the University of Florida, University of Georgia, and Auburn University. But now we have been members of our PNRX team from Clemson University, from Mississippi State University. We collaborate with others from North Carolina State University, and maybe one day David Langston from Virginia Tech as well. But we have a tremendous, it's a growing number of people. In fact, when you look at the population, we can no longer, those who participate each year in annual revisions of peanut or X, and making it and tweaking it, we can no longer fit in that room that, our, that uh, Steve showed. In fact, we can't fit in the whole building. We have to move to larger facilities because of the participation across disciplines from entomologists to weed scientists to breeders to plant pathologists to agronomists to economists we have to have larger part larger uh, we have larger and larger uh, participation research continues to improve the prediction of tomato spider root virus okay some of that research Robbie Olatinwo back in uh, the early 2000s has looked and he's found there's a relationship there's a relationship between the incidence of tomato spider wolf virus and the inso phase we have in the winter before, whether it's a La Nina or an El Nino or a neutral year. And he's shown that in, in his situation, a La Nina year, which is characterized by warmer and drier, we tended to have less tomato spotted wolf virus than we did when we had a neutral year or an El Nino year. How can we incorporate this and why is that? How can we incorporate that into the risk index? The risk index starts out as something very simple, something could be calculated, but the research continues to better understand the factors that are there. How would a La Nina situation in El Nino, how would a La Nina or an El Nino or a neutral base, how would that, how can we build that in to the risk index? Clarence Kodad, who was a graduate student with me, he wanted to further look into one of the most important characteristics for tomato spotted wolf virus, and that is the planting date. And we all know, and Mark Abney will tell me every time, that the planting date is tied directly to thrips populations. And research is continuing by integrating, by collaboration, David, by using this tool out of North Carolina State University, by using these tools to try and better explain what's happening between planting date and the thrips and our risk index. The main point here is that the risk index, whether it's tomato spider, wolf virus, Dan, or whether it's white mold, stem rot, or leaf spot, it continues to be tweaked and expanded upon. Spider wolf index is a model. 
Okay, one of the things I'm most proud of, I think that Steve and Albert and those who originally had this idea would be most proud, is we can look around at disease and management across the United States and the world as well and see where similar concepts have been used and are continuing to be used. North Carolina State University has outstanding examples. In fact, Dave Hoisington and I, we were talking about this, about how it's being used in Africa and other countries as well, building upon the idea that you can assign risk, you can define these characteristics. So what started out in 1995 in Kingaroy in Australia is not only what we're using for peanut or X, but that same idea is growing into other risk indices as well to include processing tomatoes in California, okay? So it's not just that the tomato spotted wool index in California using processing tomatoes has its genesis with that same idea, that same work that went with the peanut or X and then the tomato spotted wool risk index earlier than that. Expanding the index. I've mentioned this before, the index originally started out with just tomato spotted wolf virus. But in about 2006, Tim Burnham, Albert Colbert, and I, and others, we realized the same factors with a few additions could be used to not only predict the risk of tomato spotted wolf virus, but for leaf spot diseases as well, and for stem rot. Okay, and so that was what happened with peanut RX. Peanut RX was originally two indices, a spotted wolf index and a fungal disease risk index, which were married together in the form of peanut RX. And peanut RX would not be here today without industry cooperation because it was the industry. In fact, it was Syngenta to begin with. Syngenta, Lyle Stewart with Syngenta said, Bob, we believe, we at Syngenta believe that what's good for the growers is good for Syngenta. We want to help partner with you, okay? And Syngenta helped us. They helped, they, just, they suggested, you all need to come up with a logo. You need to have an idea. And that's where the peanut RX came forward. In 2008, Syngenta was the first company. Is Henry McLean in the room right now? It may or may not be Henry. First company that came out with that, partnered with us. But soon after that, we had a host of them. There's Blair Colvin here from FMC. All right, Joe Calabro from Valent. All right, Keith Rucker from Bear Crop Science. Scott Croxon from Niche No Cannot Be Here. Abraham Fulmer, is he here? Is Abraham here? He better be here. Is Abraham here? That's good. He better be here. Kaylin. Kaylin Saul. Saul. From BASF. All right. Well, thank God you're here, Kaylin. I don't know about where Abraham is. All right. That's two of my minutes right there. But I will say this as well. Did you know is Mitch Scott Crockett and also with um, with DuPont or with Corteva? They've all partnered with us to help make this better. Sharing the index today and beyond. The message I want to leave you with is not only the collaboration that's gone in, BASF, FMC, Valent, Nichino, Bear Crop Science, okay, Corteva. It's not only the increased collaboration, Mississippi State University, Clemson University, University of Georgia, University of Florida, and Auburn University, but it's also expanding the opportunity to build that. And working with Barry Tillman's idea for how we can build this into an online tool and Joe LaForest, We've come up with, now we have this process, we have it online where we have a peanutrx.org. They can find out all the information. Growers can find out the information. They can find out about the background. They can find out about the disease. They can go through and run the indices to find out what the risk is. The most important thing, in my opinion, there's two important things about this index. The first thing is that it allows you to go before season, before you plant your first peanuts and already have an idea what your risk is the white mold, the leaf spot, the tomato spotted wolf virus. And if you are high risk, you can change, you can play with the, the variety, the planting date, and you can find out what it takes to become low risk. But here's the most important thing. I was challenged in California when they brought out their tomato spotted wolf processing, tomato processing index. And they said, Bob, nobody is using this. We are counting the clicks on the internet. We're getting very few in the clicks. And in their opinion, they said, that's a sign of failure. I said, I promise you that's not. You could go to any peanut grower in Alabama, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, or Mississippi, and you could ask them, which varieties are more resistant to spotted wilt? What planting dates are more important as far as spotted wilt go or white mold? Do you want to use thymet or imidacloprid? or Vidate, what do you want to use? I can promise you that whether they go through and they run every single one and they enter a final data, I can promise you that the beauty of this model has been the simplicity that every single grower in the Southeast recognizes how these factors A, interrelate with each other and how they affect their impact, their risk to smash spotted wilt and the white mold and leaf spot. They didn't start with me, 
That started a long time ago. It continues today. We look forward to collaboration. Thank you for your time, and thank you for the industry here for supporting Peanut Rx. Thank you.